This is the Centre for Optimism's Optimism Cafe, and today we welcome a very special guest, Silicon Valley's John Hagel in conversation. I'm your host, Victor Pert. Uh, welcome. Uh, this is the Optimism Cafe for the uh, Centre for Optimism. Uh, and today I am delighted to have one of my rock star thinkers, John Hagel, um, join us. Um, I first met John um, through his book, The Power of Pull, and it pulled me towards him. Um, he is an absolutely sensational guy, a great thinker, and I'll just do a little more of an introduction, but um, I don't need to do much of an introduction because you've joined us to hear his wisdom. And I'd also like to welcome Robert Masters, uh, the chairman for the Centre for Optimism and one of the world's rock stars in crisis communication. So we're um, very, very well um, suited for a great conversation. Um, so John Hagel, welcome. Um, you are uh, an extraordinary thinker. Um, as I said, for me, uh, the book, The Power of Paul is still in speeches of mine almost a decade after it was written. Um, you've written many, many books. Um, you are a veteran of, of 40 years in Silicon Valley. Uh, the Deloitte Center for the Edge is a, a great place for edge thinking, and, and you can talk uh, more about what edge thinking is. Um, and you, know, you are in demand all around the world um, for your capacities. And as you said to me in the preparation for this, um, you've actually never been busier. Um, people really need your wisdom. Uh, to help pull them through the pandemic and beyond. So always in the Centre for Optimism, Optimism Cafes, John, our first question is, what makes you optimistic? <laughs> uh, a, lot of, a lot of things. I'd say probably at the core of it is, um, I've always been fascinated by history and uh, I've spent a lot of time studying the long arc of history for humanity around the world. And uh, while clearly there are ups and downs, I would say that the long-term trend or arc is very much towards people achieving more and more of their potential. And uh, every time we think that we've kind of maxed out and that we're at the, at the limit, something happens to increase potential even further. And so that gives me significant optimism that we uh, as, a, as a humanity are definitely um, for millennia advancing in ways that uh, we need to constantly keep in mind as we face short-term challenges or crises. Uh, clearly it's not just a smooth ride all the way up, but uh, eventually we figure out how to overcome those obstacles and get to that next level. And what's keeping you optimistic through the pandemic? I mean, you're there in, in just outside of San Francisco in lockdown. Uh, we're not as locked down here in Melbourne and Australia, but a lot of the people online are in, in even more dire straits. So how are you keeping yourself um, optimistic through the pandemic and beyond? You know, again, part of it is just broadening the, the horizon and not just getting consumed by the events of the moment, but looking at where, where this is all headed. And I, I think one of the things that uh, gives me optimism is the number of people that I talk to uh, virtually, of course, not uh, physic <laughs> no, no physical connection, um, but the number of people that I connect with who are telling me that this, this pandemic has has been a catalyst for them to really reflect on what's really important. And the realization that they've been so distracted by things, small things that are consuming their time and attention. And this is really giving them an opportunity to pull back and say, what really matters? And resolution to focus more on that as they move forward. So I think that gives me optimism that a lot of people are going to come out of this with a much better sense of what really matters and how to have more impact. And we were talking the other day, I mean, you're involved in Singularity University and a lot of those future-orientated um, organizations. So 
what are you seeing there that, that thrills you and, and helps to you know, sustain that optimism for the future of humanity? Yeah, I think uh, it's certainly one of the reasons, as you mentioned, I've been in Silicon Valley now for 40 years. Uh, this is my 40th, 40th year here. And um, there were a couple of things that drew me here, the power of coal, if you will. Uh, one was um, this growing sense that digital technology with exponential price performance improvement is going to be a key enabler of progress in ways that we can't even imagine. And that, it, you know, the exponential improvement, I mean, most of us just have a hard time grasping what exponential is versus linear uh, progress, linear thinking. And so really keeping that in focus and saying where and how are these technologies really going to make a difference in our lives um, and focusing again on the opportunities that it's creating but and related to that, I would say that what drew me to Silicon Valley was the the culture here is at least the past 40 years has been really driven by a sense of optimism. The people here, if you are in conversation with them, they're focused on what's the big opportunity. You know, yes, we have challenges, yes, there are problems, but what gives them excitement and focuses their their time and attention is how can we get more impact with opportunity versus just you know worrying about the challenges? So in your explorations, you've got a unique perspective of, of what I what you call opportunity-based narrative. Opportunity-based narrative. And I know you've had some conversations with our other board member, Sean Callahan, publicly on that. So do you want to share what you mean by opportunity-based narrative? Yeah, it's something that I've come to really focus on because I, I think that um, one of the big challenges I see in, in the world today is that um, I travel around the world and even before the current pandemic, um, I was struck by the degree to which the dominant emotion that I was encountering was fear. More mm. and more people consumed by fear everywhere at the highest levels of organizations, in the front lines, in the communities, fear. And, you know, while I, cannot, I, I understand at one level why that people are feeling that fear, I also believe it's potentially very dangerous and, and uh, limiting in terms of potential. So my focus has been on how do we help people overcome fear and move to a, a more sense of optimism and excitement about the future. And in that context, I've ended up developing a, a bit of a distinction. I mean, everybody uses the term stories and narratives to mean roughly the same thing, which, you know, either one is, can be used. Um, I make a distinction. Uh, for me, stories are basically self-contained. They have a beginning, a middle, and an ending to them. It's over. And the story is about the storyteller, or it's about some other people. It's not about you. You can use your imagination, figure out what you would have done in that story, but be clear, it's not about you. In contrast, for me, narratives, the way I define them, and again, it's all my, my definition, narratives are open-ended. There is no resolution yet. There's some kind of big opportunity or threat out in the future, not clear whether it's gonna be achieved or not, and the resolution of the narrative hinges on you, the audience, it's a call to action to say your choices, your actions are gonna help determine the resolution of this narrative. And in this context, I think opportunity-based narratives are a very powerful way to move people from fear to hope and excitement. If you can frame a really inspiring opportunity and motivate them to move and, and take action and have some impact, They'll overcome that fear over time, and particularly when they start to come together with others who share that, that commitment to that opportunity, that really reinforces that, uh, yes, we, we have fear, but, and I, to be clear, I, I don't believe we're ever going to end fear or overcome, you know, have nobody feeling fear. It's a question of how do you overcome the fear? How do you move in spite of the fear and have that view of a, an inspiring future that can motivate you. 
Yeah, I've seen some interesting stats, John, about 40% of the population um, are, um, and I'm sorry, I've got to fix my microphone, 40% um, of the population are weighed down by fear. The other half are looking for um, stories and narratives of hope and optimism. And I, uh, as I said to you yesterday, the uh, membership of the Centre for Optimism has doubled um, during the pandemic. So we now have over a thousand members. Um, and, and surrounding yourself with optimists, um, Bill George, you know, the author of True North said, you know, to me, you know, I get my optimism from being surrounded by optimists and positive people. Um, Megan, the Duchess of Sussex, um, in, a, in an interesting comment about a month ago, said you need to surround yourself by realistic um, and optimistic people. So what's your formula for other people getting involved in these narratives? You lead them. I see you on Facebook. I see you on Twitter. I see you on LinkedIn. What's your formula for people joining you in this positive movement for narratives? Well, again, part of it is just communicating, inspiring opportunities, getting the message out that there are opportunities out there in the future that we could really uh, target and achieve. But I think on the other side, equally important is this focus on near-term action. What can we do in the short term that would start to show some impact so, you know, many people, when they're confronted with a long-term inspiring opportunity, they basically will dismiss it and say, well, that's a fantasy, that's never going to happen. But if you can show real impact in the short term, now you start to inspire people even more, give them more confidence that this can be achieved, more optimism. And I think that's, and by the way, I think that's where, to me, stories and narratives intersect, because Again, narratives for me are the open-ended, big opportunity out in the future, call to action. But then you can tell stories about people who've already started to move to address the opportunity and the impact they've achieved. It builds more credibility for the narrative. And it also makes the stories more powerful because now it's not just a one-off thing of one person or one group of people doing something. No, this is part of something much bigger. And that's really exciting. Now, one of the things you you um, you explore passion, and and I remember you had a, a huge project on passion about five years ago, and um, I think you even wrote you are passionate about passion, um, and again, one of the things you explore around optimism is this question of curiosity, and and again, you've you've talked about the passion of the explorer. So do you want to share with our audience, what is the passion of the explorer? What makes you so curious? Yeah, we, we, this came about because of our broader research agenda at the Center for the Edge. One of the things we've spent now over a decade looking at is what we call the big shift, the forces that are transforming the global economy. And I love paradox. And the, to me, the big shift has a core paradox, which is on the one side, the big shift is creating exponentially expanding opportunity, as I talked about in terms of things like digital technology and other forces that are expanding opportunity. But at the same time, the big shift is creating mounting performance pressure on all of us. Competition is intensifying, pace of change is accelerating, there's more and more pressure on everybody. And I think the interesting thing, so it led us to say, okay, if that's what's happening, Let's go look at environments where people have achieved sustained extreme performance improvement. And what can we learn from those environments? We ended up looking at arenas as diverse as uh, extreme sports, you know, big wave surfing, extreme skiing. We ended up looking at online war games, you know, talk about mounting pressure. You're going to die if you make the wrong choice. Um, but the interesting thing, despite the diversity of all those environments, was we found the participants had a very specific form of passion. And we came to call it the passion of the explorer. But it, it, without going into too much detail, there were three elements that came together. One was a long-term commitment, not just to being in a domain, but to having an increasing impact in the domain. So they were committed to getting better and better and having more impact in whatever domain they were in. The second component was what we call a questing disposition. 
which is the, their reaction when confronted with an unexpected challenge is excitement. Wow, this is an opportunity to get to that next level. How would I do this? How could I do this? And then the third element was what we call a connecting disposition. When confronted with those challenges, their immediate reaction was, who else can I connect with who can help me get to a better answer faster and achieve even more impact? And those three together are just so powerful in terms of driving learning and, and, and accelerating performance improvement and achieving major opportunities that people would have thought were unimaginable. So. <laughs> You've just, I'm, I'm just impassioned and alive. I just find that, that entire conversation extraordinary. Uh, Rob Masters, you know, you're, you're watching global comms. You're um, looking at, at people changing their strategy. Um, the Center for Optimism's survey on strategy shows that nearly 80% of corporations are now reviewing their strategies. What's your take? Uh, I, I agree. Um, it, it's a it's a turning point as far as um, all business and all governments are concerned, and and as um, John just referred to, as people themselves. So people are reviewing exactly who they are, where they where they are, and what they should be doing. And one of the key things that I found quite interesting from John's work um, at the Edge was that um, he believes in the power of numbers. And he went on to explain the, the meaning of 2020 as the year. So John, would you like to elaborate on that? Because I found that a fascinating insight into, um, into the so-called numbers and what we're currently experiencing. No, no, please go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was, well, I, I was basically, I was uh, interested in, the, in your explanation of 2020 and uh, what, those, what those numbers mean and how they gather um, uh, people together and, and uh, addressing the future. And I thought 2020, it's a great element as far as the strategy is concerned and injecting, as Victor was just saying, this optimistic outlook into uh, where people should be going this year. No, absolutely. I think, you know, we're at the beginning. I mean, I, I some people challenge me because the, the perfectionists or the precisionists will say, well, we're not, the new decade doesn't start until 2021, actually. <laughs> For me, uh, 2020 is, is the, uh, the launch of a new decade. And I think it is an opportunity for us to really step back and reflect on what really matters and how can we get to even higher levels of achievement and achieve more of our potential. And uh, so I, I'm excited that we're, we're entering a new decade and I call it the launch decade. Mm. I, so are you seeing people actually as part of that launch decade actually changing their, their outlook and their plans, especially in the business and government area? Because um, I was privileged to listen to a, a, a fellow from France the other day and he, he was talking about the brain and how the brain um, is being starting to be measured as far as the leadership messages are concerned and uh, in, in um, communicating strategies and desires for communities to change and listen to uh, instructions. And so he, he said he basically was advocating that leaders now need to actually ensure they fully understand what their messages mean and how they should uh, project those messages, not only in verbally but also in the strategic uh, materials that are associated with that in, have you what's your experience in that area oh boy that's a whole other conversation i you know i i've actually um my my business career has been in business strategy i you know, started my work at bcg and was head of leader of the strategy practice at mckinsey and company and um have now a delight but over the years, I've actually come to believe that it's much less about strategy and much more about psychology, that if we don't understand the emotions that are driving people, that are shaping our choices, the best strategy is just gonna sit on a uh, shelf somewhere. And so the key for a leader, in my mind, is going beneath the facts and figures, if you will, and really recognizing what are the emotions that are driving the people that I'm working with and how can I move people 
again, to the extent they're feeling fear and reluctance, how can I move them to excitement and, and passion and a willingness to take on greater risk to achieve bigger opportunity? And to me, that's, again, where narrative in my mind comes into play, that leaders who can frame powerful opportunity-based narratives are going to be much more effective at bringing people into uh, into motion and, and impact. And so... And what, what, what was your judgment on that in life now? Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Um, I was just thinking, you, you talked about fear, and yeah. we're certainly in a climate of fear at the moment. So what would yeah. your judgment be of leaders in the way they are now? You know, it's hard to generalize, but I would say, um, and, and again, we can differentiate between corporate leaders, political leaders, you know, social leaders. Um, I think it, it, talking about corporate leaders, as a generalization, my, my sense is most of them are actually shrinking their time horizons right now. And folk, the, the word that I cringe at, uh, even though it, again, has many different meanings, but a lot of leaders are using the term resilience. We wanna be resilient. And when I probe and ask, what do you mean by resilience? The answer I usually get back is bouncing back. We just wanna bounce back to where we were. That's success. And to me, that's, no, <laughs> that's failure. If you're just bouncing back to where you were, you're gonna be just as vulnerable to what happened and, and not being addressing the opportunities that are available. How do we learn and grow from this experience and become something much bigger and better? That to me is the where leadership should be playing that role around inspiring people to learn from this and change. And in fact, one of the findings from the Center for Optimism is the extent to which the research shows that resilience relies on optimism. You know, it's, you can't be resilient unless you're, you're optimistic for a better future. And we've just had Mark Matthews, who's one of my um, favorite optimists, uh, join us. Um, extensive work in um, Papua New Guinea, in Fiji, and in the islands. So he's seeing a lot of these populations at work. And Mark, you had a couple of fantastic questions and comments to share with John. Thanks very much, uh, Victor and, and John. Thanks for your generosity of being on the, this call this morning. I, I, I wanted to take from your commentary about fear and the pervasive media reporting we see on current events fuels this fear and mistrust. And whilst there's a level of optimism, the trend always tends to move towards the negative. And with political leadership also playing on this emotion to their advantage. In this environment of uncertainty, how can we create a more positive dialogue? Huge question and, and a, a challenge, I would say. I mean, again, I think that um, the... Uh, I'll just speak about the U.S. Uh, political situation right now. We have, I believe, both sides of the spectrum, a uh, political spectrum, are equally guilty. We have all fallen into what I call threat-based narratives. It's all about the enemies coming to get us. We're all going to die. We need to mobilize now and resist. And you hear that and you say, oh, my God, I'm right to be afraid. <laughs> I'm going to die, <laughs> you know? Where is the political leader that is articulating an inspiring opportunity-based narrative? What could we accomplish if we all came together? What amazing things could we accomplish? I don't see that on the horizon. And I think that's, to, in my mind, what's absolutely essential. And, and I, I'll also say that one of the pushbacks I get about all of this is, well, come on, John, you know, our brains are, are wired from our, our evolution to be responsive to fear, you know, the amygdala rules. It's, it's just gonna to respond to fear and that's the way we are. And I say, okay, wait a minute. You know, yes, the amygdala is there and we have that fear response, but tell me one person who doesn't have a hunger for hope. Who wants to live in fear? Who said, I, I wanna live in fear? Nobody. We have a hunger for hope, and I think the evidence, at least certainly in the U.S., is when we get some isolated politicians at specific points in time, I use the example actually of uh, Barack Obama in his first election campaign, which was very successful, 
was oriented around a message of hope, of opportunity. What can we accomplish? And I actually believe on the other end of the spectrum, Ronald Reagan and his early campaigns, very much driven by a hope-based, an opportunity-based narrative. But we're missing that today. And I think that's what we have a hunger for. And I'm optimistic again that when somebody emerges with that opportunity-based narrative, they'll get a huge response. I think that on the, on the hope question, it's interesting that Martin Seligman, the guru of positive psychology, uh, wrote his autobiography last year with uh, the title Hope. And when I met him, he said, well, I like your question, Victor, what makes you optimistic, but you can add the words what gives you hope. So it, it broadens out the audience. Um, Mark, you, you asked um, the Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea, Marape, what makes him optimistic. And he gave you a, a very effusive answer. But part of it was innovation. I think you wanted to raise the question of innovation with John. Yes, thanks. And we're seeing, John, those flashes, I think, in terms of the narrative from leadership around the world. But I, I, it's only those little flickers of spots, really, and then there tends to be that tendency back towards the, the, the centre line. And you talk about resilience and that moving forward into a new paradigm. And I think innovation is the key. And I don't want to kind of delve into what innovation means in a sense, but really thinking and changing the way that we adapt to the new world. And I think that innovation is that key to defining your place in what's projected to be a new world ahead. For some, they will lead and succeed. But for the most of us, we'll struggle with the thinking in and adapting to these new paradigms. What are the, some of the ways that that you believe that we can train our minds to prepare for the future, please? Ah, well, a big question. Again, I think that it's not, it's not easy. By the way, I, I should say that I, I, when I'm asked if I'm an optimist, I say, or a pessimist, I say I'm both. And, and the distinction that I make is I'm a long-term optimist and a short-term pessimist mm -hmm. in the sense that I see big opportunities and I believe they're achievable, but I'm also very realistic about the near-term obstacles and barriers that we're going to encounter as we try to address those opportunities. And I think having both really motivates people to act because, you know, yeah, the opportunity is not going to happen just by itself. You need to act, you need to move forward and come together to address it. So I think, to your question, I mean, it's there's a lot of things that, that have to come together, but again, in my mind, it's partly encouraging people to really find and find and pursue their passion. I think so many of us in society have been told, just find a, something that get, pays a good income and, you know, will support your family and that's success. You know, I have two two daughters, and the only advice I gave them as as children was find your passion and don't stop until you found it. You know, whatever you need to do to explore to to find it, and then when you find it, find a way to make a living from it, and that's going to be success. You'll be motivated to achieve more. You'll overcome whatever fear you have and you'll be optimistic. Again, passionate people, in my experience, the passion of the explorer are really optimistic. They're driven by that opportunity to accomplish so much um, in coming together, and, and it inspires them to take risk, willingness to take, passionate people will take whatever risk is necessary to get to that next level of impact, and um, they're excited about it. And, and again, they also, coming together, they reinforce each other, um, because they share passion about a particular opportunity. Mm, yeah. John, um, we have many people, many questions, and the, the nice thing is that John said he's going to have the time to answer and engage. And uh, the next questioner is, is Kay Clancy, and uh, Kay has a, a wonderful question emanating from your book, The Power of Pull. Kay? Some of the things that are flying around my head at the moment that I'd really love to, to get your thoughts on are the distinction between the what and the how. So I think one of the challenges for leaders is they're incredibly good at working out what needs to be done. So task-based things and activity-based things. But the challenge here, I think, for us in, in leadership terms is how do we get people to embrace 
how they need to behave differently, knowing that any change in behavior creates a cultural ripple through the organization that will cause challenges for them. Um, and, and I'm seeing at the moment, I'm seeing um, care and, and optimism uh, wrapped up instead of into checking in moments when I check in with people that I work with, instead of doing that, I'm seeing leaders doing checking up moments, which of course doesn't create the ripple that we'd like it to create. So when you were writing your book and when you were thinking about the power of pull, what were you thinking in terms of the cultural challenges for organizations and leadership? <laughs> huge cultural challenges. I mean, the uh, institutions we have, again, broad generalization, but all the institutions and not just companies, but governments, schools, uh, NGOs, are all basically driven by push-based cultures. It's all about pushing people to do what they need to do to get the job done. Um, and the pull-based culture is, is very different, very challenging, but I think the, the role of leaders is absolutely critical in navigating through that cultural change. And one of the distinctions I make in terms of leadership, in a push-based culture and organization, the mark of a strong leader is someone who has an answer to every question. No matter what the question is, you can count on the leader to have the answer. And by the way, if they don't, maybe it's time to get rid of them and get somebody who does have the answers. Our belief is that in, in this pull-based world that we're moving into, the mark of a strong leader is the one who has the most powerful questions and who will freely say they don't have the answers and they need help. And so that's pulling people in to say, here's a really powerful question. Boy, if we could answer this, imagine the things we could accomplish. But I don't have the answers. I need help. And it creates a culture where, number one, it's okay to ask questions. It's not just okay, it's absolutely essential. And it's okay to ask for help, you know, to express that vulnerability because that builds trust and it builds a sense of community and collective action. And that's very powerful and I think really helps to foster that pull-based pull -based culture. Brilliant question. I think... Um, Jeff, Jeff Kerr-Bell had, had a question and comment to make as well. Yes, John. Um, look, there's, uh, there's so many questions I'd love to hear, and I love that uh, the idea of the um, opportunity-based narrative. As you can see from my background, it's sort of a philosophy that I support and, uh, and uh, like to um, promote as well. Um, th there are a couple, of, uh, a couple of questions, but one of the things I'm really interested in, um, you've written many books, and I know it's a bit like choosing a favourite child, but... <laughs> If there, was, if there was one of those books that you would say that um, most supports driving that uh, opportunity-based narrative and that has the most, if you like, optimistic impact on individuals or the, the positive impact on the world, which one of those would you choose? It's the book that I have yet to write. It's still coming. Come on. <laughs> There's more, more to come. Uh, no, I, if I had to choose, I, I guess I would pick the, uh, the power of pull, I think, is really, um, at least among the people that I talk to, Brad, it, they, they're inspired by it. It's, it's really uh, giving them a sense of opportunity if, if they came together and how could they pull others into this. And again, a key notion in the power of pull is this isn't just you acting alone. It's how do you pull people together to accomplish so much more than you could do on your own. And um, I think that's huge. And a, a, cheeky, uh, a cheeky second question is, um, you're at the center of the edge. Are you finding in this current environment that the edge is probably not quite as uh, far out to the edge, that people are pulling back a little bit closer to the middle, or are you finding the really strong leaders are actually pushing further to the edge to, to, to drive change? No, that, that is a concern that I have. Again, I, I think at one level it's understandable, but I, I, my experience is most of the leaders that I talk to are, are taking an even shorter term perspective and it's all about bouncing back to where they were. It's not about how do I get better and, and use this as an opportunity to learn and grow. It's just tell me how I get back to where we were, <laughs> where we, you know, and so. Fantastic, thanks, thanks John, appreciate it. Appreciate it. Oh, absolutely.
Stuart Allenson has a, a question about climate comms and optimism. <laughs> Welcome, Stuart. Uh, thank you. And John, first of all, thanks for your energy. I can feel it all the way from San Francisco to Melbourne. So that's much uh, appreciated on a cold morning. Um, I, I work in the area of climate and in, in tech, disruptive technology. My question is, climate change is sold on the basis of fear. Um, um, I think that prompts the sort of amygdala fight, flight, freeze response. Um, I'd love your views on how that narrative can be moved to a positive one and context to this, um, the Guardian, which typically peddles doom and gloom and the world's going to hell in a handbasket, just this <laughs> week has just switched its whole focus to telling the stories of what is being done to address climate change. So yeah, with that background, I'd love your thoughts on that, John. Thank you. No, it's, it's a great question. And I, I certainly, it's one of the areas that I've been spending time thinking about because again, I, I do worry that the, um, the climate change movement, while it's certainly addressing a very significant issue uh, for humanity, um, has fallen into the threat-based narrative. And I do think it's, it's undermining the, the potential for, for mobilizing people to really uh, take risk and, and uh, innovate and come up with new ideas. And so I, I you know, I, I'm not an expert in, in the field by any means, but um, I do think that there, there's a need to reframe it around the, op what's the opportunity? If we all came together and realized that we are a planet of living things, not just people, but you know, uh, plants and oceans and the whole ecosystem. Imagine what, how we could help that ecosystem to thrive and every participant in that ecosystem to grow. That it's not, you know, again, I'm, I'm maybe a bit controversial on this, but I, I'm a bit resistant to the notion of sustainability in the sense that I don't want to just sustain what we have today. <laughs> I want to get to higher and higher levels of, of our potential. And that to me, and we should be doing that for everything, for plants, for animals, for the ocean. How do we help all of the, the components of the ecosystem achieve more of their potential? That's exciting. And I think, you know, it could be a more positive or opportunity-based narrative that could get people willing to take risk. Great thoughts. I, I endorse that. Thank you. Uh, Roland Weber is in his um, car office. Um, he has a young family locked up at home. Uh, Roland, you um, had some comments and questions to make to John. Yes, thanks, Victor. Hi again, John. Um, look, John, I can relate to your comments you made in relation to um, understanding what really matters, that there's always another level, and that people who understand this now, I guess, and understand the narrative now, they'll have even more impact in the future. What would you say to leaders who are so caught up in and focused on the now and cannot see the enablers for progress and opportunities beyond now? What would you say to these leaders? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I have an overarching answer. I, again, I believe it's ultimately about psychology and understanding the, the emotions of that particular leader and what's going to motivate them to really to really act. I, th I think that, you know, there's, there's a lot of, again, I find that interesting when I, when I talk to leaders at very senior levels and, and acknowledge their fear, see their fear and, and say, you know, this is right. I mean, you're right to be afraid. There, there are forces in the world that are making more and more pressure. Um, I get this just huge sigh of relief from the leaders because their concern is, oh my God, you know, maybe this is just me psychologically, I'm unbalanced and I'm seeing things that nobody else is seeing. No, <laughs> no, it's right. You're right to be afraid, that, that's, that's okay. But then the question is, do you want to be afraid? And what can you do to overcome that fear? And what are the things that would excite you and motivate you? And I, I think, you know, again, there are a lot of factors. One of the things I hear from a lot of leaders, particularly 
for in public companies is, oh, we're prisoners of our investors. You know, they just want short-term quarterly performance and that's all they want. And so I can't worry about uh, look ahead and, and see big opportunities in the future. I just need to deliver that quarterly, uh, those quarterly numbers. And, you know, I, at one level, I'm sympathetic. Yes, investors are, are taking more and more short-term kind of views of performance. But the, the pushback I give to the leader is, when was the last time you went to your investors and articulated a really compelling long-term opportunity for your company or business? Something much bigger than anything you've accomplished so far. And they would look at me like, you're crazy. How could I possibly do that? You know, the future's so uncertain, or too many things. And so I, my response is, well, what do you expect investors to measure you on? If they don't have a sense of what that big opportunity is out in the future, all they have is short-term quarterly performance. And then you've got this vicious cycle going. The more they focus on short-term performance, the more the leaders focus, the more leaders focus, the more the investors focus, and it's a vicious cycle into, uh, into oblivion. Thanks for that, John. I'm mute. George Osborne, <laughs> uh, you've got some, um, you work in economic development, you've got some great questions. Um, what, what did you want to raise with John? Uh, thanks, Victor. And, and first, thanks for setting this up. It's fantastic. Uh, thanks, everyone else, for your questions. Uh, but for John and Robert, um, I head up an economic development team that's supporting 15,000 businesses employing over 100,000 people and punching out a gross regional product of around $14.3 billion. Uh, this is obviously a huge challenge for us. We are looking at running a couple of webinars and a seminar in a, maybe two weeks time with its focus very much on what comes next. So it's going to be a message of hope and optimism, but it has to be tempered with some realism and some useful suggestions, actual suggestions, particularly for SMEs that are really struggling in this environment. My, my question to you, you both, and I'll be more than happy to hear from the other panellists, is how would you recommend approaching a seminar like that? Uh, businesses, some of them are smashed, some of them are scared, some of them have pivoted already. Um, we've got to give that message of hope and optimism, but we've got to give them some realistic guidance and advice. How would I balance maybe a half-day seminar and how could I lead into that with a couple of webinars? Yeah, I think uh, certainly uh, an important question. It's, um, I, I think that um, at least the, the approach that I, I've been taking is focus at, at one level on the real problems that they're facing. So one of the big issues um, that I'm seeing a lot of companies wrestling with around the world is supply chain disruptions. Right, this, one of the implications of this pandemic is well, when we thought we were gonna get the supplies we needed, all of a sudden they've disappeared, now we're, we're stranded. Viewing that as an opportunity, again, to rethink, okay, what is it about our supply chains that made them so vulnerable and fragile? And what could we do now to redesign those supply chains to make them more more flexible and responsive to unexpected situations and not just viewing it as responding to the next pandemic, but responding to unanticipated opportunities. I mean, that's equally important, if not more, is that flexibility to quickly address an opportunity that's emerged that, you know, current supply chains would have a hard time uh, addressing. So I think that balance of being re recognizing and responsive to the challenges and, and you know things that are they're wrestling with today but again framing it as an opportunity now to rethink and and get to another level of performance that's going to serve them very well and Robert what was your perspective it's um, a very just picking up on what John was saying it's very much addressing the now and then addressing uh, what you want to be and picking up on Kay's point to take them down that path is the how. And if, if you can get them to think where they want to be and how do they want to get there, that, that's an important part of the, the half day or the day session that you've got. So addressing um, the optimistic outlooks that uh, what could be and, what, and how they're going to get there. 
And, and I, I would just say too, I mean, one of the things, again, I should mention, we, I'm talking about a lot of the research we've been doing at the Center for the Edge. All the research is freely available. It's uh, on the web and you can get a lot more detail than I could certainly offer in this, in this discussion. But one of the approaches that we've been strong proponents of, and it ties together with some of the other themes here, is the zoom out, zoom in approach to business and to strategy. On the one hand, framing a, a 10 to 20 year view of what's the big opportunity given the forces that are reshaping the global economy and our relevant markets or industries, what's that really big opportunity that we could be targeting? And then zooming in to say, what very specific initiatives could we take in the next two, next six to 12 months that would have tangible impact in accelerating our movement towards that longer term opportunity? And again, I think back to emotions, um, that helps to overcome fear. On the one side, you're framing the opportunity, the big uh, inspiring opportunity. And on the other side, you're focusing people on action today with real impact today, which helps to build confidence. Yeah, we're making progress. This isn't just a fantasy. This is something we could really accomplish. So that may be part of the answer too is, getting them to think about what could they do in the very short term that would start to move them in this new direction. Now, honored, um, John, Pete Williams has joined us. Um, hey. And um, <laughs> Pete, Pete is the head of the Deloitte Center for the Edge in Australia. And like you, John, there was one sentence in a speech Pete once gave that said in this modern era, it's, it's costs less to start a business than to write a business plan. <laughs> so I've taken that to heart for the, the next, I think it was 12 years ago you told me that one, Peter. So Peter, you had some points you wanted to raise. Yeah, I think um, it's been interesting in Australia. I've, I've never seen us pulled in so often, John, um, you know, in the last few weeks. It's because like you guys think differently. We need to think differently. How would you do this? So that's been exciting. The other, I actually had a meeting with the transformation and innovation heads at Deloitte yesterday in Australia and we've been doing some stuff you know I, I've got some guys to knock out a COVID stimulus finder tool because I'm saying look I've been working in the bushfires so I haven't had a lot of optimism this year I've gone from bushfires to COVID um, but the um, it was like you know bushfire people are trying to find all the stimulus they can't why don't we develop a simple tool where they can find it bang we get it out in a week and the head of tax like says well the biggest thing in town at the moment is JobKeeper stimulus package and it's really complex can we Put some tools out for that but interestingly what's happened with the first one he was a bit oh i'm not sure now he's talking about the magic of it that we could design tools working with our clients to work through in a virtual workshop where you're you know sort of filling in a form and doing a report and i'm i'm starting to see the sort of i'm pushing this sort of thing is like you know this is a time where so many people have got so many problems we've got a lot of smart people let's find hone in on zoom in on those problems but let's do it with a view of how could this transform the way we work in the future because you know personally i've never been more productive and i never want to go back into an office again i live in the country so um and you're probably the same but um yeah i think it's and even to george's question it's like guys look for an immediate opportunity and that may be together um and then adjust you know one of the things that john talks about at scaling edges is learning faster to move faster our first project with the COVID tool took 14 days. The next one took nine, even though it was orders of magnitude higher. So again, it's like, try something, learn, reflect, what did we learn? Go again, do it better, do it faster, and just get into that cycle. And I think, you know, scaling edges is sort of um, something that I'm, I'm, I really use all the time in Australia. It's one of the papers that John wrote a number of years ago, and it's more relevant than ever. So um, yeah, you know, what are we learning? What are we thinking? What can we try? And that's leader's role is to clear the pathways, not to create the checkpoints, to go back to Kay's point. You know, like, as a leader, what's in the way? And the other thing I'm finding is social capital's massive. If you can ring a senior person organisation and say, hey, like I had one yesterday, we want to add, add, do ads on Google for um, JobKeeper. Uh, we've got a blanket ban on advertising. Boom, hey, head of strategy, can you tell the head of marketing to let us through? Bang, 13 minutes. It's this... And that's what I'm excited about, the speed. So I've, I've actually become very optimistic, Victor, 
Um, <laughs> the, uh, even the worst things are, it's like, but I think it's because I'm doing stuff and I'm feeling like I can do. And I think if I was just sitting here thinking, you know, what am I going to do? And it's all stuffed. It's a bit like I, I find doing just do something, learn from it, do again. You start to build your own resilience and that flows to others. Anyway, I'll shut up now. Thanks. Oh, that is that is the Pete Williams I love. What do you reckon, John? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> On the edge, for sure. Now, our friend, uh, Sean Callahan, um, your great friend on narratives and stories. Sean, you, hey, you're going to raise uh, a couple Hi, of John. Hi. Lovely to uh, meet you face to face. Yeah, at least virtually. <laughs> actually, I ha first thought, thought I had was actually for George, I've just, I've just been um, uh, reading, just finished reading a book called Splendid and the Vile, and it was a, a story of Winston Churchill during the London Blitz and he had developed a pattern of speech making, which was optimistic for people. Um, but the way he did it was he would start off by more or less telling the story of all the terrible things that had happened. You know that you know they were they went and had this battle here, and this was going on there, and France had capitulated here, and 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 people would sort of go, "Oh my God, I'm, this is the situation. I can see how bad the situation is." But then he would always finish it with a feeling of, you know, but we'll fight them on the beaches and, and, and sort of built this optimism at the end. And it got me thinking that if you could get your folk to actually share stories of the things that are happening, but also stories of the, the almost stories that represent the future, the good stories, that would be quite a motivating experience for people. Um, anyway, that was just a thought that uh, was going oh, to thanks. Thanks, Sean. What was the name of the book again? It was, it's called The Splendid and the Vile by Eric Larson. It's a terrific book. It was published this year. Um, I must have read it in three days. It was uh, a page turner. Um, so it sounds like the battle between Churchill and Lady Astor in the uh, Houses of Parliament. <laughs> yeah. But, um, John, of course, I was, um, you know, my ears pricked up when you were talking about narratives and stories. And, um, and I... I I think your definition makes total sense. Uh, I like this idea of an expanding and emerging narrative. Uh, I was thinking that when I worked at IBM, if you were to try to tell the narrative of IBM and you included everything, you'd be there forever. But in <laughs> fact, what you do is you, you, know, you, you pick a bit here and a pick there and, and there's a thing that's actually helping you understand the potential future. And of course, that's always, always emerging. It's, it's never stopped. But, but what I was interested in, in understanding is, is, is there any optimistic narratives that you're hearing in Silicon Valley at the moment that uh, grabbed your attention, that you sort of think, okay, that's an interesting way of putting it? Or, um, yeah, I'd, be lo I'd love to hear any examples that you're, you're hearing over there. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I won't give a current example, but I, one of the examples that I use, and I, I should say, again, longer conversation, but when I talk to most executives about narratives, they say, oh, we have a narrative. You know, we started in a garage, we faced amazing obstacles, we overcame them, and more to come. You know, it's open-ended, a lot of more opportunity ahead. And my response to that is, that's about you. That's about your company. What is the call to action to the customers, to the people you're speaking to outside your company? Yeah. And is it to buy more products? Great. You know, that's really inspiring. And the example, just quickly, of uh, I think a powerful narrative that drove huge success was Apple in the early days of its business. The narrative was condensed into a slogan, which was think different. But if you unpack that slogan, it was the notion that for decades we had digital technology that took away our names, gave us numbers, made us cogs in a machine. Now, for the first time, there's a generation of technology that can allow us to express our unique potential and individuality. But it's not automatic. It's not going to happen by itself. You have to think different. Will you think different? It was a call to action to the customers to say, you have a huge opportunity here. And yes, by the way, we Apple have some products that can help. But the focus of the narrative was not the, the company. The focus was on the opportunity for the customers yeah. out in the future and inspire and motivate them. And I think it's the reason why for many people, Apple became the equivalent of a religion. It yeah. spoke to such a deep aspiration and need that it was exciting. 
Yeah, that's a great example. Thanks, John. Terrific. Um, Sally <laughs> Arnold is, is on the Gold Coast, so I think she's keeping our beaches uh, on patrol and works with Bloomberg and National Geographic and um, a lot of the world's leading media organisations. So, Sally, um, what are you seeing and what did you want to ask John? Well, good morning and thank you, John. Um, the, uh, I've, I've absolutely loved all of what you've been saying. The, uh, there was an article yesterday in the Washington Post, who I also do work with um, for full disclosure, um, but it talked about the female world leaders being um, the voices of reason among the coronavirus. And we're going from St. Martin through to Jacinda Arda in New Zealand, through to um, Angela Merkel, up to Iceland. And these leaders have spoken with reason and with emotion and connecting with the citizens and also delivering the best results that we're seeing across the globe in many cases for the containment of the coronavirus. And you spoke earlier about the uh, need for leaders to understand and connect with emotion rather than data um, as we go forward. I'm curious if you have looked at your gender research of the female to the male in this space and and are the lessons going to be coming from the female leaders without having to necessarily have that bias but there is a different way of thinking and obviously this is working at a global scale yeah uh, that's a whole interesting other subject i actually gave a talk at tedx and wrote some blogs on it um, oh, it was a bit would you controversial. Tell us that TEDx talk? I'm sorry. Uh, which TEDx talk? I'd love to see that. If I yes, may. yes. If uh, if you Google uh, John Hagel plus feminine archetype, you probably find the talk and my blog post. But thank you. Basically, uh, the proposition was that as part of this big shift that we're going through, um, my belief is actually the the uh, model for success in the traditional institutional model was the masculine archetype. It was all about masculine attributes. And my belief is if we're really committed to transforming our institutions and moving to what I call scalable learning, we have to embrace the feminine archetype. And it's not just bringing in more women as leaders, it's we as men embracing the feminine archetype ourselves. And that's a yes. very, <laughs> A, a significant uh, uh, opportunity that I think is is really critical, and so would welcome your your feedback if you have a chance to take a look at some of that material. Thank you. I'd love to. Uh, Richard's <laughs> joined us, and and Richard um, works in the spiritual space. He runs an organisation called Swell, so it's spirituality and well-being. And Richard, you had a question you wanted to ask John. Yeah. Uh, Oh, thanks very much, Victor. And John, it's been great to listen to you and um, hear some of your wisdom. And just on that, I've been reading a really interesting book as well, which is called The uh, Intelligence Trap. I don't know if you've uh, come across that, but it's, uh, it talks about evidence-based wisdom and it talks about all the things that we're talking about today rather than the, um, the, um, the intelligence test, which um, sort of has uh, run, its, uh, run its course. But um, my question was... Um, referring back to some of the things that you said about short-term impact and then long-term gain and I think one of the biggest things that we can do is look at the education system and you know looking at the two motivators being love and fear and sort of we've let the education system somehow deliver a community that um, enjoys fear a hell of a lot more than it enjoys the love motivation so um, how do we go about uh, restructuring or modifying or um, providing a different framework that allows us to um, create a, um, a society that um, delivers what you said before about looking at the whole of the, the, uh, the world and the planet rather than just um, our little piece of it. Oh boy, a whole other subject. Uh, I'm very passionate about it. I'll, I'll tell you uh, just as context, uh, in, I was in third grade 
and I made a great discovery. And that was that I could forge my mother's signature. And I started, <laughs> I started writing notes to my teacher asking for Johnny to be excused from class today because he has a doctor's appointment. And I became known as the sickliest child in third grade because I was always at the doctor's. <laughs> and it just, it, I, I hated school, even though I went through all the di different degrees and everything, I hated school. And it was because I had this sense that it was squeezing out of me any passion that I might have or any curiosity or any imagination or any optimism. It was just listen to the teacher, take good notes, memorize and play it back, show that you memorized. And I believe that was, and I've studied actually the school system in the United States, the history of the school system. It was explicitly designed to take unruly children and train them so they could go into a factory and follow instructions without question. And I think very successful in doing that. Mm -hmm. I think the challenge now is we have a whole different set of institutions that we need with a very different set of capabilities in our children. And our educational system is just not equipped to cultivate those capabilities. And so I, I think it's a, a very significant challenge and opportunity, again, to draw out the potential that these children have and, and to take as the primary mission. I mean, what, a, what an interesting mission for schools is to help every child explore to find their passion and to in, in embrace that curiosity and exploration and then to give them opportunities once they've found the passion to get better faster by learning together. Um, and acting, not learning through action, not just sitting there listening to a teacher. Again, longer topic, but I, I definitely believe that's a huge, huge opportunity. Now, Bill Gormley's joined us and he's been very active in the conversation. You wanted to raise some points and a question, Bill? Yes, uh, can you hear me? Indeed. Yes. Uh, this is great stuff, John. I love your point about <clears throat> affecting the sweep of history and making a difference in the in, in the big picture and uh, it remind, reminds me of a case study we had at coca-cola where the federal judge uh, declared that coca-cola was a racified culture and they needed to de-racify in other words get race out of the problem and they're headquartered in atlanta as you know and so we set up an internal university there to make a very long story short and had 28 key skills that every one of their 5,500 managers had to learn. Um, and so 28 times 5,500 was the number of classes that they had to be certified through. But it was a powerful way of boiling everything down to what are the key 28 questions that we want our managers to be able to put into our culture, to rebuild our culture and to reinstitutionalize the culture. And it was a very powerful experience um, that I thought my question to you would be, um, have you seen other companies, other institutions where you've gone in and been able to build like an internal university to reinstitutionalize the institution itself from the inside out? No, it's a good question. I, I can't point to particularly to any large company that has a, a training programs or in, uh, university that, that's driving change. I mean, I, I think there are a lot of, obviously every large company has training programs to help people acquire the skills they need to get their next job done and all the rest. But um, I, I think that there's a big opportunity for, and, and part of it, again, I, I'm hesitant a bit in the sense that while I think training can have some some value. Ultimately, it's learning through action in the workplace that's really going to drive the change. And the, until and unless, I mean, I, I again, and I, I'd be a bit uh, exaggerating, but I know a lot of companies have creativity programs where you go to a, a, a week-long session to cultivate creativity. And then they go back into the work environment and they're told to do their job without question. As instructed in the manual. So that creativity is just completely squashed. Even 
So unless, until and unless we're changing the workplace to really draw out those capabilities, I think training programs are going to have marginal impact. They're part of the part of the answer, but not the entire answer. We've got. I think if if we can conclude with the last five short interventions, because you've been on for a long time. Um, so James Strock, who is also an advisory board member and the leader of the Serve to Lead group, and who's now living in sunny San Diego, enjoying it. <laughs> James, there's so God. It's so great to see you, and I'm standing at a Churchill desk, a replica of his exact standing desk. So his hope uh, reaches everywhere, and it certainly keeps the pandemic under perspective. I mean, as long as the Luftwaffe is not coming tonight, I feel pretty good. <laughs> I wanted to ask a couple of quick questions uh, from this tremendous discussion with John Hagel. One is in respect of psychology. It seems like every field is now discovering psychology. And I was interested to know in particular what your thoughts are if about the big five personality traits, that kind of analysis, if you're familiar with it, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. And then one more quick question, if I could uh, beg your pardon, and that is your quick thoughts on generational analysis. How much do you factor in people's uh, being a different age and generational cohorts when you think about these big questions. Thank you. Wow. Uh, no, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I'm familiar with the big five personality traits. There are many different frameworks and models um, to characterize psychological differences or different uh, personalities that we have. And I think they're valuable. I think one of the key things to uh, I think we have to acknowledge, and it's not generally acknowledged in the standardized uh, institutions we have, is that we all have very different personalities. And recognizing that diversity, not just recognizing it, but embracing it and drawing it out. Um, you know, one of the things I'll just quick aside is, is well, I won't. Uh, we talk about productive friction as a way to drive learning. And I think that's part of recognizing the differences that we all have and drawing them out. So I think that there are big opportunities to recognize the differences and, and embrace them. And then I, I, on the generational differences, yes, I think there, there are, I, I'm frankly a bit skeptical about generalizations uh, on the generation side. I mean, everybody talks about the millennials as having this particular uh, orientation. I have so many millennial friends that I know who don't have that orientation that I'm just not clear with how how evidence based those generalizations are versus again just recognizing we're all different and um, yeah so <laughs> uh, Michelle Waters you've got a brilliant uh, question and intervention on the circular economy. Yes, I just wanted, John, because uh, I'm working with a whole systems model, so that's about the private, public and um, civil society and walking across silos and, and out of that, and we're seeing a little bit of that with the COVID-19 where the, the public is working with the private to get, you know, supplies out, aeroplanes are flying, this, doing different things, but the whole notion of a circular economy is really... Um, in the, in the areas that I'm working in is, is coming out of, up, up a lot. And I wondered if you have any thoughts on that, whether you get excited about that. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I think, um, again, longer conversation, but I, I, I do, um, certainly the, the value in seeing things at a system level and the unintended consequences and the broader impacts that our actions are having, absolutely essential. Um, I do have a bit of a, a, a challenge with the notion, the model of circular, because again, to me, that's like sustainability. I just want things to go in this circle, an endless circle, versus what I would describe as a spiral, that we're, as we, as we continue to circle, we're actually delivering more and more value to the participants than just going in a circular manner and uh, doing the same things, reusing the same things over and over again. I, but longer conversation for sure. <laughs> um, uh, Ernest Starbeck um, has uh, 
put a question in writing, which is, um, what is one simple thing we can do to pull together? Wow. You know, I, I, I think part of it is uh, continuing to have these kinds of conversations. But one of the things that I've become a, a strong proponent of, and again, I've written quite a bit about what I call creation spaces, but it's the notion that if we're really serious about having more impact and addressing opportunities, organizing into small groups and cells mm -hmm. where we're confronting a similar environment and opportunity and holding each other accountable and supporting each other, encouraging each other, but then connecting those cells into broader networks is really where I think the power is. So not just having conversations like this, they're certainly important and valuable, but it's committing to action. Okay, now what are we gonna do as a result of this conversation? Then coming back and reflecting on what did we learn from that action and how can we have even more impact over time? And, and if you look at the conversation in the side panel, we've certainly achieved a lot of that. Look, we've, you've, you've been so generous, John. Um, as you can see, the questions, the comments, they've been, so evocative so i have to thank you rob masters do you want to add a concluding comment of thanks i think i'm on mute um thank you uh I, i'd just like to uh reiterate what you just said victor and to thank you john for your generosity and your time but all, also to the 30 odd uh, participants and for their very interesting questions and engaging questions so thank you also for joining us it's um it's been a, a a remarkable session this morning thank you and john anything to wind up one last thought <laughs> no i mean I, I the thing that i love most about these kinds of interactions are the questions i mean i i you know i've always said the questions excite me the answers bore me and i, I think it's all about what's the what's the next question that could uh, be the inspiration to learn more and achieve more so absolutely love it thank you well, it's a great thank you to John Hagel for joining us at the Centre for Optimism's Optimism Cafe. Thanks too to our chairman, Robert Masters, our advisory board member, James Strock, and our great friends, Mark Matthews, Kay Clancy, Jeff Kerbell, Stuart Allenson, George Osborne, Pete Williams, Sean Callahan, Richard Sigusma, Sally Arnold, Bill Gormley, and Ernest Starbeck. Uh, we'd love you to be involved with the Centre for Optimism, so feel free to visit our website. There's lots and lots of material there to support your optimism and your infectiously optimistic leadership. Uh, and we'd love you to become a member um, of the Centre for Optimism. Wishing you all the best for a great day.